Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for this week in tech is provided by Winamp for Android, the ultimate media player for your desktop and Android device, featuring wireless sync. Download it free at winamp.com slash Android. Video bandwidth for Twit is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 282, recorded Sunday, January 2nd, 2011. The Golden Boys. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Ford and voice-activated Sync with My Ford Touch. Make calls, play music, and more with Sync and My Ford Touch. Available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more information and online demos, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to publish a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off the lifetime of your new account, go to Squarespace.com slash twit and use the offer code twit when you decide to sign up. And by GoToAssist Express. If you're an IT or software consultant, up your competitive edge and grow your business with GoToAssist Express. For a free 30-day trial, visit GoToAssist.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show that covers your technology needs. And yes, we're back for a brand new year, 2011. And I thought, given a brand new year, I'd bring in the three oldest farts I know. Uh, in fact, I believe combined, we've got between the three of us, four of us, we've got 250 years of experience starting in the lower right-hand corner. I'll do this in reverse. Larry just observed that you have the three longest running technology columnists in America who are still writing yeah. on the air right now, starting with Larry Magid, who is at CBS News and his website, larrysworld.com. Hey, Larry, good to see you. Good to see you, Leo. You it's have never nice been on Twitter before. I don't know how we managed that. And only only at CES when I'd run into you on the, on the streets or the hallways. That's but right. It's nice to be right here well, at home. Well, this time we ran into each other at uh, Google at their um, annual right. media party, and you said, when are you going to have me on Twitter? And I said, next show. So here it is. Next year. Yeah, and next. the hors d'oeuvres, by the way, were quite good. That they night. were. Lots of beef. Also joining us, uh, and I'm really thrilled to have him on. We, we've been, a, you know, a big admirers. You know, I, I, I said a lot of kind things about him during the campaign. Ladies and gentlemen, Barack Obama is joining us. Wait a minute. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> his lips don't move. <laughs> Where'd you get that, John? This is what. This is, this is part of the gift you sent me. You sent me this Fez that says Twit on it. And there's your MacBook a, Air, yeah. A second, I and then you sent me Barack's head. <laughs> Send me the head of Barack Obama. That's a great mask. It's, a, it's one of the better ones. It's really good looking. Where'd you get it? Oh, we didn't send you that, John. I don't know where you got that, but we didn't send you that. I didn't send you a MacBook Air because as soon as if I sent you a MacBook Air, I'd have to send Jerry Pornell a MacBook Air, who's also joining us, and he officially qualifies as the longest. Jerry has Macs. Yeah, he doesn't need any more. In fact, he says he's on Windows today, and Jerry said, I hate Windows. <laughs> hey, Jerry. Hi. Great to have you. Windows is all right once you figure out how it works, but it's just like going from Windows to Mac is always a little confusing. Yeah. And with Macs, Everything is either very simple or it's utterly impossible. So <laughs> you don't have to fight with it. You you don't figure out how to do it. It just either just works or you give up. I like that. That's that's with, that's very apt. Yeah. With Windows, you keep fighting with it because eventually you'll get it. Right. It'll capitulate at some point. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to have the three of you on. All three of you, I've been reading for years, uh, and it's a it's always fun. And I think there's kind of an opportune. Time to have you on because we're Comdex is long gone, but the so the <laughs> last standing big trade show is the Consumer Electronics Show, and it starts uh, Wednesday. Well, Thursday uh, the show floor opens, but the first uh, press events I think are Tuesday. Yeah. Larry, I presume you're going. I'm on my way. I'm you, leaving Tuesday morning. You get no yep. choice. Don't Jerry, choose. Jerry is going. How long has it been since you've been to this? Oh, about I think before the 
radiation therapy back before that. I, I don't think I have been to a major show since uh, since the brain cancer. By the way, Jerry has written an autobiography, but it won't be published till 100 years after his death. That's not true. <laughs> I'm actually writing a That's book a about one. the radiation therapy called the, the Mask on the Wall. And in fact, in a little bit, I'll go get the mask to show it to you. It's really a scary thing. That's what you but, wear uh, when you're getting the radiation? They pin your head down to a table with it so you can't move for obvious reasons since they want to focus everything exactly properly. So I thought that would make a good title for a book about surviving so. brain cancer with radiation as uh, the mask on the wall. We've had you on since uh, that, but uh, just to uh, recap, uh, all you, is well now? Yeah, you had me on since that, but my voice was in pretty awful shape. But at Larry's party the other night, Greg Benford tell, tells me I sound like the irascible old, old <laughs> curmudgeon I always did. So <laughs> Your voice finally matches your writing style. <laughs> Start it's back again, yeah. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, at Nibbins' party. But Hi, Larry, I haven't seen you in a long time, I think. It's been a while, Jerry. It's good to see. I see your son at uh, CES and various events. In fact, I think we're going to see him at Showstopper. Yeah. Well, hopefully he, see you. I know Lee will be there as well. Alex provides the the uh, the the web access for all of those shows, all of those peep yep. shows that they, they do. <laughs> Is that what you and, call them, peep shows? <laughs> well, we used to call them peep shows, didn't That's we, John? Name. Didn't know what we used to call them? Uh, I the, like that name. So, Sheldon, yeah, I saw, I saw Alex, Alex Cornell there last Sheldon, year. and he... Sheldon really hated them. I mean, Sheldon Edelman hated those those little press shows like nothing you've ever seen. He tried to book every ballroom in Las Vegas to keep people from having them because they competed with his comdex. Didn't work, but he sure spent a lot of money trying to stop them. You know, I don't know if I would go to CES if it weren't for those shows. Those are the most efficient ways to see what's out there because you can walk around a ballroom and have a little sushi or whatever, but but mainly actually see products without being crowded. It, it's actually a, a oh, positive Those things aspect. are packed, Larry. Come oh, on. Oh, yeah. Uh, Not the, compared the, to the floor. Yeah. Showstoppers and Pepcom and, and, and of course, you you don't go to these things without having lunch at Perino's. So. Oh, yeah. At Piero's. Oh, that's gone, yeah. by the way. Don't go to Piero's. It's a hole in the ground. Well, uh -oh. uh, that's not true. Pat's having lunch <laughs> at... Uh, oh, oh you're right. Be, you're oh. right. Piero's is still there. It's the it's the club on the other side of it. That's, the uh, club on the other side, but Piero's is there, and Pat's having lunch there, I think. At least three days. Her soggy pasta. <laughs> no, it's not soggy. No. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, no. no. I love Pat. I think that's great, and I think that event's great. And I haven't been in ages, so I will go over to Piero's. You're not going, are you, Leo? Yeah, I'm going now <laughs> to you apologize are? to Pat. Yeah, you might as So, well. John, you're not going to CES, right? You don't, you, you don't do this stuff anymore. I'm actually going to go this time just as a why not. You're oh, kidding. So, well, we'll <laughs> see you at Pepco. I, you know, I got to do something to make some extra money. Because all oh, I yeah. got for my gift was this head. and uh, <laughs> It looks good on Barney, by the by way. way. <laughs> I think it looks good on the Barney It's great doll. on Barney. And, Jerry, we'll get you a fez. I, 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 you, you were an oversight. I don't know how it could have happened. We will get you a fez. Make a note. Yeah. The funny thing, about, I've known Jerry a long time, and he's always saying that he, he, wants, he likes the, the, the idea of the fez look. No, he doesn't. <laughs> But I think he would look good in a fez. I do. Uh, let's see. I don't have a fez. I have a. That's good. What is that? I have a hat from uh, that's the some Knights sort of... of St. George. Oh, that's good. You keep yeah. wearing and that. You have that old it's Finnish, crazy a, Finnish uh, Lapland uh, hat? <laughs> it's called a Da Vinci. No, it's, it, it's it, it, Da Vinci invented this hat, I think. It's really? kind of a muffin hat. Yeah. It's Larry, an Italian Larry, Renaissance Do you have anything hat. you could yes. put on? Uh, let's see. Chat I can grab here my, at the uh, Twitch show, my, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, let's see. Now you don't want that. Um, <laughs> I do. I, I was showing you these guys off here. I can show you my picture of John Dvorak, though. Let's 1987. See. Wow, that's when John. That's looked, a long time. He looked like. Uh, a, I remember when Maggie Cannon asked yep. me if we should hire a guy named Dvorak for uh, for for her magazine. God knows when. When I was a columnist for it. Now, Jerry, you know, I, Dvorak published my first piece in InfoWorld in probably 82. When you were editor of InfoWorld, John, was it 79, 82? actually. But when was it? So, yeah. 
First piece in InfoWorld was in 79. I was a, wrote an article. My, uh, yeah, my fez is so big it can't piece. actually fit in the camera. We have to... That's not the oh same my. fez that you gave us. No, this is the yeah. chief twit fez. <laughs> Look, they have to pan all the way back to get that in. <laughs> all right, enough about yeah, fezes. Lovely. Let's talk about CES because that's uh, not the biggest story of the week, but certainly uh, what's on our mind. We're going to be going down there ourselves for a uh, wall-to-wall -wall coverage as we did last year uh, starting uh, Wednesday with uh, the uh, digital experience uh, event and then showstoppers and then all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, last year it was 3D TVs and mm -hmm. uh, e-ink display, you know, tablets, readers. Most of the and 3D guess TVs what, Leo? came out. Very few of the readers came out. Yeah. This year we should see the readers. Lots of them. Yes, the same stuff, only this time there'll be more product. <laughs> now, well, I it's interesting because, because uh, both Barnes & Noble and Amazon are saying that their respective e-readers, the Nook and the Kindle, are the best-selling products they've ever yeah. sold. Let me give you a story on that. My daughter, who is a got a doctorate in anthropology and archaeology, wrote a story in the universe of the Moton God's Eye, which is the first novel Larry and I did together back in about 74, and it sold maybe three million copies over the years. And she put that up um, on Kindle and on the it's called Audis, and she put that up on Kindle and on the Nook about two weeks ago now, and it sold about a thousand copies already. Well, that's no very good. Nothing, just there it was, and she's getting seventy percent royalties. And I was looking at it; she has already got as much money from that as she would have got as an advance for as a first novelist from a major publisher. Wow. Jerry, no, if you were starting over as a sci, so. if you were starting over as a sci-fi author today, would you uh, would you look at self-publishing in uh, in electronic form? Hey, Leo, I don't know. I got a letter from a reader who has got several nonfiction books in print, so he knows how to write, and who did a lot of words in fiction and threw them away until he got to got something he thought was worth doing and he sent it to a major publisher and it's a year later and they haven't read it yet and if you gotta wait for a year for people to read something but in that time you could have earned as much as they're going to give you as an advance so i guess the answer to that is i don't know i never had to <laughs> to establish myself as a writer. I managed to have a friend named Robert Heinlein who read the first thing I wrote and liked it enough that he sent it to his agent. He also made me swear to never tell anybody that until after he was dead. See, I told but, you there'd be an autobiography. Yeah. So... This is... There, the way, Audis is available uh, if you go to Amazon.com and search for Audis, the moat in God's eye. There is the... Uh, there's the book, hmm. seven ninety nine. Yeah, it's it's done with Larry and my permission. I, uh, it, it it's a story that it, it's an interesting story. It doesn't change the moat universe much, but it's it's a good story. But the remarkable thing to me is how well it has sold in almost no time with almost no publicity. Well, some of that is, of course, the how how much people love the moat in God's eye. I, I'm gonna read it just because I love the story. I bet and, that the sales will double after this show. <laughs> I'm hoping you have no idea so. the power of Leo Laporte. <laughs> so as long as we're promoting so. books, guys. Okay, go um, ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Shameless What's book. Yours? So this is actually free. It's called Facebook for Parents, oh, and it's you're going to make a for fortune with that one, Larry. FBParents.org. I don't know if you could bring up FBParents. You, you've you've done a lot of uh, stuff, Larry, for protecting kids uh, online, yeah. which I really appreciate. I have used myself and referred to it many, many times. You did it for the missing uh, kids uh, uh, site and right. uh, yeah. safekids.org and so forth. So this is continuing dot along. Or dot com, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is this is part of Connect Safely. I don't know if you can see the logo there. There you go. Yeah, ConnectSafely.org is our website. And uh, Parents Guide to Facebook is, uh, gosh, about 40 pages. We have to revise the online edition about every three hours I because bet. Facebook keeps adding features. But this is up to date as of uh, two days ago. 
And uh, I hate to write a book these days. I'd hate to write a tech book these days because stuff changes so fast, especially on if you're writing about websites, which could be changing. You know, well, that's why I was thinking about Jerry. What Jerry commented is, I don't know if I ever want to write another printed book. We have a printed version of this that we give out at events, but I think that it's all about online distribution. Is simply because print becomes history books much much too quickly. Yeah. How about you, John? Do you still do you still do print books? Don't you, John? You know, I haven't done a print book for a while, but really? I'm going to do on. I'm going to go. I'm taking a different tact. I think online books are going to sell print books. Mm. Corey Doctorow uh, I, says that. To some I extent. think Corey's dead on. It. Corey's actually a kind of a pioneer with a lot of this, these ideas, and uh, I believe it's true. And I, I'm basing it not just on him, of course. My, it's, in fact, it, it was confirmed by my son, who uh, JC, who has a, the big Kindle, the big one. And he has a lot of books on it. And by the way, he's got a, it's a bug in it, too. We have to send it back. But anyway, he's got a lot of books on it. And he, when he starts reading some of these books, after he has it on the Kindle, he wants to buy the hardcover. Everybody's it's, uh, it's, go it's ahead. weird. Yeah, no, I think that's true. But anyway, if you oh, really like happens, a book, you want to have it. That, that was sort of the reason why Dr. O and, and Eric Flint said that piracy probably helped sales and maybe it was true back when there were not many sales of ebooks but the thing was that a pirated ebook and they usually were not very well formatted and so forth would often cause people to go buy the printed copy of the book and that's certainly the case especially with people that nobody had heard of except from reading the the uh, the ebooks, but I don't believe anybody ever bought an ebook as a result of getting a pirated ebook. Well, that's an interesting point. I, I buy almost now all the of my books on Kindle now. Selling hardbounds. Yeah, no, oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and what I, and what, what I like about ebooks is, is the spontaneity that I carry. I typically the iPad. Sometimes I'll even read a book on my on my uh, Android, though not very often on my phone. But just the idea that I could carry around my entire library with me, and I never know when I want to read. But here's the problem with Kindle books: is I have started dozens of them. I've finished a few. I, I wind up buying books and reading them for a while, and then. But well, that's that's bad for you, Larry. But good book. for authors. <laughs> it's great for authors. I yeah. know. No, I do the I'm, same I'm a thing. Good customer. I, I do the same, but I've always done that with print books too. I often abandon books. Sure, yeah, I, the I theory start reading is, since a I have it in my pocket, I'm going to pick it up it again. Down, that face down stop. on a table, and it's still there 10 years later when my <laughs> wife tells me I've got to clean the room up. <laughs> I think know? if we panned around Jerry's library right now, we'd see a few books face down. <laughs> you really don't want to see my desk. <laughs> we can kind of see it, Jerry. <laughs> it's over there. Oh, and, okay. Um, it's It's spilling over, I hate to tell you. Oh my! It looks like that. Oh my! Uh, if you're not yeah. watching on video, just to, you can imagine probably. That's on a good day. <laughs> Jerry, you're a man of my heart. I think a disorderly <laughs> my a disorderly uh, library is a sign of an orderly mind or something. Right. Somebody, I've been to Jerry's library. It's not that organized. Bum, but what the heck? <laughs> uh, actually, the Kindle made it onto almost everybody's list of the top uh, products of 2010. I'll give you uh, one list. This is from CNN. I'm sorry, from Wired, uh, the Wired Gadget Lab. Number 10, Kindle 3. Mm -hmm. I put it in my top five, actually. Uh, number nine, this is, a, I don't know, a kind of, there's, they have some odd ducks in here. The Canon S95 point and shoot, which is an excellent point and shoot. But not alone in the category. There's some other good ones like the LX5. Right. Samsung Galaxy Tab. That's an Android, 7-inch Android tablet, which I would agree with. I put it in my top five. I thought it was a very good product. I, did, did you agree, Larry? Did you, uh, did you yeah, play I, with the I Galaxy? Yeah, I actually looked at it in Germany the day they announced it. I happened to be over at uh, the CBIT show. And I thought it was, uh, or IFA show, excuse me. I thought it was quite good. And I'd, at first, I was a little skeptical of the 7-inch form me factor. Me too. But... I think it has its place, and I'm looking forward next year, this year, when uh, when Google finally comes out with an operating system that's optimized for tablets, to, to seeing a, a lot of good products out there. Well, I, I love Android. I'm a big fan of Android. Carry an Android phone. And, and, uh, me too. To some, yeah, not quite as reliable as the iPhone. I think the iPhone's still a little more solid, but I love the openness of Android. Yeah, I would agree with you. I think the software is more mature. Number seven, the MacBook Air. I put that in my top five. In fact, that was my number one pick of the year. I just love the 11-inch MacBook Air. iPhone 4, number six. Well, 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 I missed that one last one. What was it? The MacBook Air, John. Mm -hmm. I love it. Too bad you don't have one, John. 
You know, they're only nine ninety nine. I have two. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Jerry. I'll send you a fez One if you'll send John foot? your map. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Don't you My, think you're great? I have four kids. I don't have any problem disposing <laughs> yeah, of things I'm no longer using. I have to say, I'm really loving the 11 chair. I didn't. I did not expect it. What do you got? What do you have, Larry? You have a camera you're holding up there. Oh yeah, this you were mentioning compacts. This is the Nikon P uh, seven thousand. Seven thousand, also in that category. Yeah. Yeah, I bought it for to bring to CES, and it's got decent video. It you know it's an SLR quality right. camera. In a, in a compact form factor that can kind of fit in my pocket. I really debated long and hard uh, what to do. That I really kind of fits in your pocket? What are you wearing? Well, that's Cargo why I bought, you know, I bought, I was looking trousers. at the same three, which is the LX5. I have an X, LX3 yeah. Panasonic. I love, I mean, it's a stellar camera. I mean, of course, I shoot a Canon 5D, but, but, but you need a pocket camera. I looked yeah. at the S95 and the P7000, and because of compactness, I picked the S95. It's the only one you can just put in the front pocket there. But, but Leo, there's one thing, and, and I think the three of us are old enough to remember these things. Uh, they're called optical viewfinders. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> Anybody out there? You know what this is, guys? Yeah. Out there in, uh, in that's, that's of the three. That's, that's the only one that's still Panasonic. Right. It has yeah. a good optical viewfinder. Yeah. That, that, of the and, of the three I just mentioned, that's the only one that does. And you can't find them on on any of the consumer level cameras. They they no. just don't no. exist anymore. And you know, people think it's just because I'm an old fart and I'm in the habit of of holding it. It's not that. It's just that when you hold a camera like this, think about that. Your arms are unless you know you've got incredibly good stability. Whereas if you hold it like this, right. you're bracing it up against your head. So it's just a much more stable way to take pictures. But I think I've you lost that You also can't see that screen in the daytime. That's right. In bright, bright light, light, you're out of luck. But, but I think we've lost that war. It's over. I think it's in the LC, the optical viewfinder will be, except on SLRs, will, will be extinct. In, well, in and that's why I have an SLR. I, you know, if I need that, I will use an SLR. Let me ask right. you, though. I have uh, lately come to the conclusion, and I, you're three great people to ask this of, I'll start with you, Larry, that the camcorder is dead. Who needs a camcorder when you've got these point-and-shoot cameras that have high-def video right. in them? In fact, I wonder about the flip camera because I know it's, it's, it's getting, you know, it gets great reviews, but it seems kind of, you know, not really necessary because every point-and-shoot camera has video. Every good smartphone has video, and it's getting better and better. And uh, I, I agree. I don't see a need for a camcorder for amateur use. Obviously, for professionals, yeah, we're going to use always gonna have video. But yeah. for your average user, and in fact, uh, at CES, I plan to do some videos, and I'm going to use. I've got a Kodak. I think it's the Z8. Z i eight. Great. Z8. And the Little reason I like it is have a microphone style. input. Yep. I'm. You notice I'm a. I'm kind of an audio bigot. I. I, I love your. Uh, it was very nice. You guys sent me a headset, but uh, I. You still didn't prefer need that. You didn't need good that. audio. Yeah, you're the so, you're the last person. I don't know why we say a headset. They, if they'd asked you me, I didn't have a headset. I just have this, this mic. Well, if, here, if they'd asked me, I would have said, "Oh, Larry's got a studio in his uh, in his living room there." Well, but you sometimes have to use them on the road. If you ever have me again, I might be traveling. Keep it with you, yep. John C. Dvorak. You think the camcorder is dead? Well, yeah, I, I've, I thought it was dead a couple of years ago. In fact, I thought it was dead once uh, the Kodak came out with the little HD versions. But of, I even uh, think the, those things are dead. Pocket cameras. I think if you've got no, a I'm smartphone. I'm not talking about the Kodak Z1A. I'm talking about the regular Kodak little oh, the pocket camera. camera. Yeah, 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 yeah. That takes an HD video. Right. Which uh, it does a great job. I, I still use a 1033, which is an old camera. You can get them for 65 bucks. It does a 720p, 16 by 9 HD video. And it's got a great microphone in it. And I'll tell you, I just went through all my cameras to see which one I'm going to take the CES to take videos with. And I pulled out that little flip cam from Kodak. And of all the microphones and all the cameras of, that I use, that's got the worst one. I'd have to put an external right. mic in it. And I you can't do that. Yeah. You know, actually, but, speak, speaking of which, you, this week Kodak announced. They're going to stop making Kodachrome. Yep. Yeah. Film is dead, folks. <laughs> In well, case you didn't know. That's news. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think I, so, the, so there's a new camcorder out since you brought it up. Yes. That I think is one of the top items. I think it came out in April. And I don't know if you've looked at it yet, but this, Leo, is something you should be looking at. Tell Are me. You, you familiar with the uh, Panasonic AGAF100? No, AGAF100. I am not. It's a it's a it's a hard, solid state camera camcorder uh, body, of course, and you, you it will take four thirds lenses, micro four thirds lenses. Oh, and, and I have a bunch these. of those because I have. You two have a bunch of them. Yeah. It yeah. just looking at the specs of this thing, it looks just fantastic. But wait a minute, look at it. It looks like something you'd get from Ronco. <laughs> I'm telling you, take a look at the specs. Look at it. It's got a handle on it. 
Okay, well, that's a, and they it's say a, it's, it's a, they say it's for professionals. I do have those lenses, which is not one of the reasons I like shooting with a DSLR is because you get great lenses, right? And, uh, and I've you, been waiting for a cam, uh, one of these cameras that takes regular, you know, camera, good camera lenses. They don't need. Why do you have to buy camcorder lenses for these? Well, things? that's a great idea. I am going to take a do look you, at this. You use any old lenses, uh, Leo? Sort of the pre uh, digital. You know, lenses I did when I bought SLS. the uh, I bought the Olympus uh, Pen camera, the EP one. Yeah. And I bought an adapter for it, and I went onto eBay and I bought a fifty millimeter. Uh, lens for an OM one, which is uh, in fact, mm -hmm. I think it was John. I, have, I, I did the same. This thing. This was your idea. That's why I did it, John. But I have to say, I was a little disappointed with the clarity of the old film lens. It wasn't hmm. very good. Now I don't know. Maybe the lens was moldy. Have you had good results, no, John? There's a couple of problems with getting one of those old OM one. There's about five different versions of that exact ah. same lens. And the one you wanted to get, maybe you have it, maybe you don't. Because I use that lens, and I get extremely sharp pictures. That's with what it. I was hoping for, and I was not. I was it's the one. It, it's the version which came out late. That that on the inside black part in the inside, it says "Made in Japan" very clearly at the bottom. Uh, that's the one lens that you want to grab. You, try you to want the one that's I'll made. Bring, in Japan. I'll bring my lens in, and you can shoot with it and see what you think. I'd be very curious because <laughs> I got the OM1 adapter, so I can use any OM1 lens. Which was a classic Olympus uh, film SLR, just a great camera. Yeah, the problem on especially Nikon and Canon is the the image stabilization is in the lens. So if you have an old lens, it'll work, but you won't get image stabilization. Right. So you, you don't get autofocus or anything. You, right. Yeah, and, and, but anything. With the, Larry, with the Olympus uh, bodies, that Olympus that, that Leo's talking about has image stabilization at the mirror. Oh, not Great. the mirror. I mean, at the, the at the, the uh, sensor. Pickup. It's inside yeah. the camera. Yeah, so you, all these old lenses are image stabilized automatically. Interesting. I believe Pentex does that as well, if I'm not mistaken. I well, have the a Pentex whole technology SLR, was invented had, by Minolta, uses, and I think they've been licensing it. Yeah, I the one I have uses AA batteries, which is another uh, thing that's becoming extinct. It's hard to find cameras with AA batteries. And that's nice for someone, travel as well. So does that is. the which yeah. one is that? Is that the seven thousand? It's had? the it's the it's a cheap one. It's the KX, I believe. Oh, okay. uh, it's a it's a very inexpensive camera that 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 does the job. I, I can go get it in a second and show it to you. One of the things we're going to do this year is launch a new photography show because, frankly, there's a lot of photography shows for enthusiasts, but I want to do a show for people who just want to who want to up their game, who want who you know because everybody has good cameras now. I'll and, watch right. that. Yeah, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Every, it's uh, I'm the you ultimate know what, Leo, amateur you are user on teaching photography. people how to use cameras. Yeah, exactly. You know what is it? What is an f-stop? <laughs> you know, right. I mean, really get yeah. get started. Composition, uh, how to use an inexpensive camera, and and get get great results. I'm very excited about this show. We're going to do it with Lisa Bettany, who is a great photographer, uh, and uh, the host. Uh, her site is mostly Lisa.com. Her, by the way, her uh, iPhone app, which was banned by Apple because it modified the volume keys to make them a shutter button, so it was actually like a real phone. Is now back on the iPhone store. I don't understand exactly what happened, and Lisa's not talking, but she's very happy that that Camera Plus application is back on. We're going to take a break. Boy, what a great crew we've got. Jerry Pornell is here, jerrypornell.com. He's still doing it after so many years, both as a great science fiction writer and as, frankly, the inspiration for everything I do with his Chaos Manor columns and Byte Magazine. You can still read the columns. Start at jerrypornell.com and, and move from there. It's great to have you on, Jerry, and you look good in that hat. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like it. John C. Dvorak is here, Channel Dvorak. John does so many things, including the Great No Agenda program. You're the not going to Great No Agenda program. Oh, I love No. You're not going to revive Cranky Geeks, are you? Though. No, Cranky Geeks is dead. Sad. Aw. Loved that. Aww. Loved that show. Also, for his first time, we have a virgin, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's pretty amazing at your age. Larry yeah. Magid is here, larrysworld.com. You also hear him on CBS Radio all the time, and he'll be reporting for CBS from CES. Please come by. We're going to be in the South yeah. Hall. We've got a we've got a big table. We did the same place last time. It's right by the subwoofers. It's a great place to do a radio show. I <laughs> 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 have to run over. They, what's funny is they have a demo that they do. This company, the subwoofer company, has a demo that they do. And um, they do it like every 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes, there's all this ruckus. And then it stops, and we got 20 clean minutes. Uh, we will be there uh, thanks to the folks from uh, Ford Motor Company. In fact, uh, we're going to be interviewing Alan Mulally, the CEO of Ford. Uh, oh, boy, I think 
early on Thursday, like 9 a.m. Thursday morning. So watch that, live.twit.tv. Uh, we're we're going to, um, you know, he's an amazing fellow because not only is he the guy who's taken one of America's great industrial companies and, and revitalized it in the 21st century, but he's also an engineer by training and by in spirit. He's the, He engineered the uh, 777 cockpit when he was at Boeing. He's a brilliant <laughs> guy, really interesting guy. So we'll talk to Alan Mulally. All of our coverage... Um, from the show floor uh, at the at our booth, but also we've got two live view cameras. We're going to be going all around the show floor. Tom Merritt will be joining me. Um, Brian Brushwood will be there. Sarah Lane will be there. Becky Worley. In fact, Tom and Becky are going to do the digital experience event. That's when our coverage begins Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 p.m. Eastern time at live.twit.tv. We thank Ford for making that possible, the great Ford Sync. You know I love the Ford Sync. Uh, Ford, I imagine, will have some significant announces, announcements at CES. Last year, they announced the new My Ford Touch, which is kind of sync plus. Uh, you can make calls, play music, and do so much more. My Ford Touch takes sync, which is already super cool. I have it in my Mustang, and adds a big 8-inch screen in the center console and two small screens behind your steering wheel. Uh, and then two five-way switch pads on the steering wheel. So you've got three LCD screens total. I mean, you are in... I think inspired by the 777 cockpit. You are totally in control of everything. And the point is you never take your hands off the wheel or your eyes off the road so you're safe. But you've got hands-free calling. I could say call Jerry Pornell at home if I had his number. I could say call Larry Maggot at work if I had his number. Nowadays, all I need is Skype. You could play music right. for most MP3 music players, including all the Apple devices. Works great with Windows Phone 7. In fact, on Windows Phone 7, it'll even read you your text messages when they come in in a, in a lovely female robotic voice. You get personalized traffic alerts, personalized weather. You get movie times, gas prices, 911 assist, which God hopes you don't going to be using. But if you ever, if the airbags are ever deployed, if you're ever in an accident, this is so cool. It automatically calls 911. You can cancel it if, you know, you say, wait a minute. But it, then it sends your GPS coordinates to 911. It plays a recorded message, then gives you a chance to speak. I mean, that's that's. A lovely safety feature. Take a look at my Ford Touch, the Ford Sync. 10,000 commands in total, it understands. Stay connected while keeping your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel at your Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury dealers. Uh, and uh, SyncMyRidePodcast.com is a place to go to find out more. And we do thank Ford so much for supporting our special coverage of CES. It's a very expensive enterprise. And uh, we couldn't do it without sponsors like Ford. I remember at Tech TV, when we, when we did Comdex... And then later CES, it was it was roughly a million dollars each time. Between taking the staff down, the sat truck, the stage, the st and now we're doing it for pennies on the dollar. Uh, and I think in many ways doing better coverage, to be honest with you. Well, that's because we didn't have boneheads telling us what to do. <laughs> I'm, for, <laughs> I'm glad you said that, but you're absolutely right. Hey, speaking of tech TV, one more note, and then we'll get back to the uh, tech news. Our good friend Erica Hill, you remember her, uh, John? Uh, she, oh, yeah, she's just love. I love Erica Hill. She's married to David Yount, who was our great floor director. They have a couple of kids. Uh, she left uh, uh, Tech TV. I, you know, I worked with her. I anchored with her during 911. I mean, uh, she was on our originally on uh, Tech TV radio, and then uh, did news anchoring on Tech Live. Uh, she will be starting Monday morning as the anchor of the CBS Morning News. So we're very proud of Erica. She's done very well. You, you probably saw her on CNN and then CBS, and now she's actually got the big job. I don't think there's a bigger job in TV except maybe anchoring nightly news, and I'm sure that's next. So congratulations, <laughs> uh, Erica. Back to the tech news. Paul Allen is back. <laughs> he got a little slap in the face. He has sued Google, Apple, Facebook, uh, saying that uh, patents that Interval Corporation, He again, this is a tech TV story because he, he owned tech TV when he was – pouring money down the hole that was the Interval Corporation. He claims that patents that Interval came up with have been infringed upon by Google's YouTube, by AOL, by Apple, by Yahoo, by Netflix, by eBay, by Office Depot, by Office Max, on Staples. On Sounds like the, uh, the reindeer in uh, the night before Christmas. Mm -hmm. the, th the suit was originally thrown out for being too vague. The judge said, well, what, exactly, <laughs> what exactly are the infringing products? So uh, Paul, who has lots of free time, has refiled, this time with many examples 
uh, including technologies that help websites suggest related content and headlines. Google News is one of the infringers, I guess. All we can say is good luck, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he needs so, the money. So uh, there's a story that I don't think is on your list. I want to bring it up. Bring it up. We kind of, it, it is, this morning, you, since you brought up no agenda, apparently uh, both Adam's iPhone 4 and then his uh, uh, his fiancés, and then a few others that we know of, the alarm function on the yeah. iPhone 4 failed as of January 1st, 2011. Can't do it. it when okay. it only rings but, once, is it? I think it's repeating alarms don't ring more than once. Is that it, John? I don't know. It, it, it just happened, didn't work at all. Didn't it didn't happen before up, with the iPhone. It did. Uh, was in, it in Australia. Time or, yes. Well, well, yeah, that's right. Down under. So what happened? It's a bug. Well, why would it be a bug? What would 2011 have to do with anything? The millennium. This has got to be a crazy it's the millennium bug. bug. Eleven years late. <laughs> yes, <Yeah, so, laughs> yeah, that's what it is. It's, yep. the, it's the 2000 bug. Eleven years late. We knew finally. It would happen. <laughs> finally, we thought this would be a big story, and it finally is. Let me see if I can uh, kind of get this uh, story from the BBC. Um, see what the exact story is. I think this is something Apple will fix pretty quickly. A glitch on Apple's iPhone. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a BBC. A glitch on Apple's iPhone has stopped its built-in alarm clock from going off, leaving many people oversleeping on the first two days of the new year. That's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Angry bloggers and tweeters complained that they had been late for work. Apple has acknowledged the problem, says it will be fixed by tomorrow, January 3rd. How are they going to fix it? I'm sure they'll push a fix. Over-the-air update. Yep. According to one of the guys in the chat room, it's going to automatically fix itself tomorrow because it's basically some bug that has to do oh. with the numbering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It apparently but only is January 1st. Or, it's only January 1st. If that 1st doesn't second. work, they've hired callers to telephone everybody <laughs> who put in for an alarm and didn't it didn't go off. Apple's response, Natalie Harrison said in a statement quoted by Macworld, customers can set recurring alarms for those dates... January 1st and 2nd, and all alarms will begin working properly beginning January 3rd. So it was the non-repeating alarms that broke, but only on January 1st and 2nd. It's Sunday. That's I just, guess people are going to be late to church today. That's just a lame it, error. It, it's a holiday. Nobody should be waking up today anymore. I, I mentioned that the I think iPhone... the CEO should resign. I, me <laughs> I mentioned <laughs> that the iPhone... Good luck getting that one. That the iPhone was on this CNN list of top... Uh, the top products of 2010 do you agree that the iphone 4 should be on that list i did not put it on my list see uh, certainly consumer reports doesn't even recommend it i think the iphone 4 is a rare misstep from apple agree disagree i i think it's an okay phone i think antenna gate was way 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 overblown i don't think it's revolutionary but uh, i i don't have any problem with it from, from the experience I've had with it. It doesn't work for me as a phone, so I can't even say it's an okay phone. I think it's a very good handheld computer. Well, now, is it the iPhone that doesn't work for you, or right. is it the uh, AT&T that well, doesn't work it's for It's kind of hard to tell. I think it's a, a mixture. Now, I am in a bad AT&T area, but I have... A Windows 7 Is there phone. anybody who is not in a bad AT&T well, area? Maybe that's the problem. Uh, it, my real dislike for iPhones to the extent that I have one is the the bad area business. If I can get onto a, a, a Wi-Fi net, my iPhone is wonderful. But um, boy, I hate AT&T a lot. And and of course, we are, we are told that there may be a Verizon iPhone in a few days. Bloomberg, Bloomberg says soon, like like in the next week, what? maybe tomorrow. Yeah, I wonder if they'll announce yes. it during CES. That would be a, a bummer for people at CES. Yeah. I, but, but the I real have question the is, money that allocated to buy Android an sense. iPhone 4. i just waiting until they jailbreak me from AT&T, I think. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, we don't. Nobody knows anything about the details of the contract or the exclusivity arrangement between AT and T and Apple. Nobody's revealed that. But maybe that deal did run out December thirty first. Apple has kind of had a little history, Larry, of letting the air out of CES the last few years. Yep. Yep. Uh, by announcing the iPhone three years ago, uh, by announcing well, not announcing the iPad, but <laughs> but but preparing to announce the iPad shortly after CES last year. And of course, CES was all about imagining the iPad. They, we didn't even know right. it was going to be called the iPad. Everybody was doing iSlate at the time. 
Um, so I was. Uh, I didn't get on a plane to fly from Las Vegas to San Francisco and back, but I know a number of my colleagues that did, and it was the biggest story of CES three years ago was a product that was being introduced in San Francisco. Yep. And uh, Bloomberg's positing that perhaps Apple will announce an event tomorrow or the next day and encourage journalists on the way to Las Vegas to stop off at Cupertino. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, don't, I think Bloomberg's wrong on that. But it could ha I haven't received anybody received an invite yet. I they, no. I'm the last guy Apple's going to invite. So. Uh, Usually, no, you I don't get any invites. I didn't get any. I am the absolute last guy that Apple is going to invite to anything. Now, why wouldn't because, they invite you? You just said you hated Windows, Jerry. Well, uh, when the Mac first came out, back when you had to use a Lisa to program it, yeah. and it was 128k memory, and it was never going to be any different. Yep. You may remember, well, my lead story on it in Byte was that it was a wonderful operating system attached to a toy computer. Uh, you were right. That, well, I may have been right, but that did not endear me to the management at Apple. Later, when the Pepsi guy came to Apple, they flooded Chaos Manor with Apple stuff. And when Heidi was director of development, I got along very well with Apple. But the old management is back, and I don't think they like me much. You think Steve so remembers? Leo, uh I am told he does. I don't know. I've only met him once. Well, maybe you and I, we... we, we <laughs> I'm on that list, too, by the way, but only recently. I used to be, uh, it's funny how quickly so, they can turn on you. Can I, yeah, can they I turn show on you, Leo? You should yeah. have taken the hint. From, <laughs> it's got to be like some of these, there's a writer, I can't remember his name, he writes for one of the big newspapers. He just kisses the behind of Apple, never endingly. Yeah. And he's always getting everything for free, gets yeah. free sneak peeks, the whole thing. You yeah. should do that. I should do that. Can, can you guys see this uh, this article from the LA Times? That's it from, says, uh, Macintosh shapes up a winner. Is that you, Larry? That was my review of the uh, of the Mac, and it started out, I rarely get excited over a new computer, but Apple Computer Inc.'s Macintosh, officially introduced last Tuesday, has started a fever in Silicon Valley that's hard not to catch. And then I talked about the young Apple CEO, Steve Jobs, who showed it to me. Yeah. I was uh, blown away by it, although, interestingly enough, I don't use a Mac now. But, well, uh, you were wrong, blown... man, and what the hell? <laughs> I, at the time, it was just amazing to me that you, that you could do this incredible graphic stuff on this tiny little computer. I was pretty sure, impressed, and I ran out and spent my own 2500 bucks on the first Mac. Well, uh, I had the for early first Mac. I got the darn thing almost immediately. I don't remember whether I bought it or Byte bought it for me, but um, the problem was I first got it, and I thought, this is wonderful. This is just terrific. And I started to do my letter column uh, in bite in those days my letter column was the accordion if they had sold a lot of ads then they needed editorial to fill in the pages yes. so i would answer <laughs> a lot old, of but things. effective <laughs> trick yeah and jerry I, can thing, you give us a thousand words we have to separate the ads <laughs> i was in hell i remember one night getting a call and saying we need four thousand words by tomorrow morning <laughs> and i bet you did it I did it. Well, Alex and I reviewed 10 books. There you go. And uh, we did, and, and I answered them. But I answered a lot of the mail. And the thing was, in those days, the mail was paper mail. And mm -hmm. I had to type the, the mail in and type the, the, the answers in. And then I had a Mac printer, their, their printer, right? And it was only about 9,000 words. And it turned out to take all night oh, to dear. print that. <laughs> because the Mac was using the same processor to sure. do the format, the print formatting right. and spooling and everything else on this 128K machine. And you just simply couldn't do any useful work with the Mac. It was a wonderful concept and a great operating system. But the early Mac was just a toy computer. Incidentally, uh, Verizon does have a... Big announcement scheduled for Thursday, 1 p.m. at CES. It could very at well CES. not. It could well be Verizon making the announcement, not uh, not Steve. That makes a lot of sense, actually. And and that, that would be probably a big story. But the funny thing is, and unless they come out with a different version of the hardware, which they I have expect, to. why would this be a big story? You know, the, the fact that another carrier picked up a phone, if we're anything besides an iPhone, well, it, it wouldn't get any ink. Yes, but it is an iPhone. <laughs> it is an iPhone. Let's iPhones are, I mean, for heaven's sake, the iPhone is clo the closest thing even now 
to the pocket computer that Nibbin and I described in Moton God's Eye in 1974. That's true. It, it's a wonderful little gadget. Jerry, do you use an Android or iPhone? I, I use an. I have an iPhone three. I am supposed to get an iPhone four, and well, don't I just, bother because the iPhone five is going to be announced on Thursday. I never got around to the four, and I guess I'll wait for the five because the the three is good enough. I think the three GS was probably better than the four, but uh, the four's camera and screen are stunning, and there that's yes, a real yes. reason to upgrade it. Just an amazing screen and a brilliant camera, and the apps that are out there uh, for cameras are fantastic. But uh, you've got to think that it's going to be a CDMA phone if Verizon has it. Maybe it'll have LTE. We don't know, but Verizon's certainly pushing LTE. That's an iPhone 5. That's not an iPhone 4 yeah. or a 4 yeah. if Plus. They upgrade, if they upgrade the hardware or, or, the, or the service, that would be very significant. By the way, I had the uh, HTC Evo from the Android phone, and the camera, even though it's an 8-megapixel camera, it's, it's not, just as good. not nearly no. as good as the 5-megapixel iPhone camera. I have a Droid yeah. X. Same thing, 8-megapixel camera, not nearly as good. But yeah. the Nexus S, which is the most recent Android phone, the one that Google uh, uh, put out oh, that, that's though. written by Samsung, created by Samsung, actually has a very credible 5-megapixel camera that I think is the next best thing. Not as good as iPhone, but the next best it's, thing. It's somewhere in this box of phones. Can you see this box of, let's see. Um, How do you get all one? of those? You, this, I, Jerry, you could have all that somewhere. stuff. <laughs> yep. I probably could. I, I, this, this CES will be interesting. I, it's the first time I've gone around to show the flag for a long time. It's also the first of those big shows where I have nothing to do. Except well, we're, go around you, and see what's going on. Hey, we're Jerry, coming to you. Something to do. Can you come to huh? Showstopper if it's a Thursday night? I know Leo's going to be there. Oh, yeah. oh I'll I'm be, be there Showstopper. at a CBS booth. I would love to have you on my radio show. Sure. So that, that's, yeah. that's one thing I'd love you to love And, you to and I'm going to book you too, Jerry. You said you'd be I, in the press room. We're going to go to the press room and we'll interview you too because we've got mobile cameras. And you know what we're going to do at Showstoppers on Thursday night? Dick Bartolo, Mad Magazine's Maddest Writer, is going to be there too. And we're going to oh, go good. around and do five Gizwiz podcasts. So we've got a, yeah. we've got a lot going on. Now, yeah. somebody asked but, me, now this is the Samsung Focus, which, by the way, is number four on the wired list, right up above the 4G uh, uh, Sprint Evo. Um they they like this one better, and this has a a very similar uh, form factor. The Nexus S, probably the same hardware, same camera. It's also a very good five megapixel camera in here. And one thing that uh, Microsoft did, which I like, is they really they not only did they put a camera button on there, but even if the phone's locked, without unlocking the phone, you press the camera button, and it goes immediately to the camera, and you're able to take a picture immediately. So that's that's pretty nice. Has anybody ever had problems with their phone just not? Accepting the touch that, like on well, my Google, every once in a while, that's the an Android just doesn't issue. Doesn't accept my hands. Yeah, that's an Android. <laughs> very well known Android issue. I have yes, no problems with this, the Mac iPhone three, except for AT and T. Yeah. As long as I've got Wi-Fi connection, this thing is wonderful. I can, I can expand the text. I can read it. I can, you know, bore people with things I looked up on the internet <laughs> when I ought to have been listening to them at dinner. I do that uh, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it doesn't it make your wife happy? Oh, jeez. Oh, yeah. I did it New Year's Eve. Uh, we're oh, talking gosh. about a movie. Uh, we're saying, what was George Clooney? Oh, no. Uh, anyway, I can't remember what it was. Oh, uh, it was, uh, what is the new uh, part that Kevin Spacey's playing in some movies between Jack Abramoff and I didn't remember, and I'm wikipedia at, at dinner. Terrible. But I got and the answer. That's the same thing at Niven's party. <laughs> I love uh, doing that. Yes. My wife hates it's nice it having a pocket computer. <laughs> a I invented the damn thing, and look <laughs> God's eye out. I have fun with it now. Well, Jerry, I'm going to tell my wife it's all your fault the next time she complains. You blame it's Jerry. It's Jerry's fault. Jerry invented it. Yeah. Uh, I'm one of Jerry's kids. Number three on this list, I might as well continue, uh, and I kind of agree with this. I put it in my top five Microsoft Connect. Mm -hmm. I love the Connect, and I think more than just a game controller, I mean, it's not just like a Wiimote. It's going to, I think, it's a new form of user interface. I think it's very interesting. You know, do you think the Connect user interface will ever go from gaming to productivity that we'll ever see it in the office? I don't mean playing games, but the idea... Not until that, it's that okay to bodies... do this in the office. <laughs> and I don't anticipate that. But they're already never know doing that in the, in the office. office with big, flat touch screens. Well, you know, the um, if you've played with the Connect, there is a UI for opening and closing things. It's mm -hmm. very much like right. Minority Report where you slide things, you hold your or, hand up. 
or or NCIS Los Angeles. Yeah, and I kind of like that. I think there's something to be said for that. It also has voice control. Uh, what's I think significant about Connect is it's cheap. It's cheap for them to right. make. I mean, it's not. It's 150 bucks, so it's not that cheap to buy. But but I think it could be a very cheap component in a lot of new devices. So I'd give them some credit for a very important release. Yeah, Even I just imagine Connect and blu-ray and all of that built all in it and with these with the cameras that are available nowadays uh, you can you can imagine a lot of interesting stuff with okay. all that yep. yep it'd be interesting to see this stuff just to see it when i used to go to you know at comdex for years i gave that best of show award I was the That's guy right. who handed it out. Uh, Sheldon and I uh, gave, gave the award. It was, of course, actually done with with twenty byte editors who were wonderful people and made me look great. But um, I, this first time I'm gonna be there without having to give anybody an award or figure out what's better than what else. And well, you got you already yeah, got two interviews great. booked, so I think you're gonna be pretty popular there, Jerry. <laughs> I have a feeling. Number two, I don't know what this is. Maybe you guys can help me. Berkeley Bionics E Legs. I I think that was the oh, I heard about that. that was the kind of um, the, the legs that help to paraplegic walk, right? So you put these legs on; they're kind of like um, kind of like a game. You know, what is the game? Uh, the mech games where you put on a suit, you put on these legs, and you could actually walk in them. They're a hundred thousand dollars. I wouldn't put it on the list. I think it's an exoskeleton. It's interesting. I'm not sure I'd put it on the list, but the number one item on the list I think has to be at, on everybody's top two or three, if not number one, is the iPad, right? Of course. Oh, yeah. Big product of the year, number one. John, oh. you think they'll sell five million? Uh, well, you know, if you just want to keep rubbing it in, <laughs> uh, I lost a bet on this, so I was a little offbeat on or off base. No, you know what, John? It's it's done better than, a, than it ought to You didn't think have. it was going to do that as well as I didn't as think you, it was going to do as well as it did. It was an iffy bet. Yeah. And uh, and of course I would have uh, probably if I'd won the bet I could have maybe even gotten a uh, an air book out of the deal. I would have given you an air. We'll make a new bet for 2011. Sure. How many do you think they'll sell in 2011? Some of the analysts are saying too, too 40. Many. Say 45 million, something like that. Yeah, too many. You know, I was I I was underwhelmed when I, when the announcement came. I went to the announcement in San Francisco, I think it was January, and I wrote that I found it underwhelming. Then I got mine and started using it, and I only use it as a consumption device. I don't produce anything on it. I don't write on it. I might do email, but I mostly watch Netflix movies and read Kindle books on it, and I love it. And and I can't imagine not having an iPad anymore. So doesn't surprise me after playing with it that it, it's done quite well. Speculation on iPad yeah. too. Anybody want to care to? Well, I, let me second what Larry just said. When I first got the iPad, I didn't know whether I liked it or not, but I, the ad is right. Do you remember those TV ads they had where they said, you already know how to use it? Yeah, that was key. It, was, it turns out to be true. Like Larry, I don't produce on it much, although you can a little bit with the uh, keyboard, the yeah. um, Bluetooth keyboard makes it makes it possible to write with it and write quite well, actually. But I could I can't imagine living without an iPad now. I'm going to continue my contrarian streak and say that I'm bored with the iPad now. And what I found You're is still in in kingdom for yeah. God's we sake. rule. That's all I do. It is a it is now a five hundred dollar We Rule device. <laughs> and I, I but you know what replaced it from your kingdom because you're always busy somebody <laughs> else has already got there first i but i buy from you jerry in fact i i tweeted it because i went to your bookstore and i i received a novel by jerry pornell and it says that and i and i took a picture of it and tweeted it because <laughs> i got a custom novel from jerry pornell of course it was in we rule Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I found that I use the MacBook Air because, in fact, I mostly yeah. want to create content, and so I want a keyboard. Although yeah. I notice I do keep touching the screen. The screen. By the way, the my um, my preferred what laptop what, what is the Lenovo. What would you think of a MacBook what is it, the that X, had X31. a touchscreen? What, which it, it, which, what, which Lenovo Air is that, that came one? Out years ago. Yeah, SSD. I, that's drive a great. That's a great computer. But again, the Air. Jerry, you asked an interesting question, and of course, Apple has already said, my, or Steve Jobs has already said, "Oh no, you don't want a touchscreen on a laptop because it's arm's length. You don't. It, it's too hard to keep your arm up like that." Would you want? That's no, true. And as a matter of fact, it, these though you have to remember that the touchscreen laptops have been done before. Oh, yeah, I got one in front of me right now. Carpal tunnel syndrome, among other problems. Yeah. You'd be like uh, Steve Martin in The Jerk. 
You'd make all the money on that little handle. Remember, he put on the glasses, made millions, and then he got all the lawsuits for the people who came out cross-eyed because they had the handle on the glasses. Well, I... That's I about as an obscure reference as you've ever done, Leo. <laughs> I just well, saw the movie the other day. <laughs> years ago, I discovered, and I, I still have a um, an HP tablet. I got it's one right here. Old old Windows tablet. Yeah. I mean, it's an old XP tablet. But yep. it's, I found that OneNote and a stylus-type tablet was the best research tool I ever had yes. in my life. But, Jerry... Uh, Tell us why OneNote works so well for you. I don't know. It just does. Because you told us. Because, because of your voice. You tell the story a million times. No, because it's his handwriting that they oh, no, use. It's your handwriting. You get to lord it over everybody with your handwriting. <laughs> oh, oh, that's true. It certainly does do handwriting recognition better for me than most people because... Um, <laughs> Should I tell that story again? Yeah, why not? You might as well. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll do a commercial. Actually, let me do a commercial. This is called a tease. And then Jerry will explain why OneNote works better for him than any other no, no. human. Wait, wait, Leo. Let's get this correct. OneNote only works for Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason, and you'll find out what it is in just a moment. Before we do that, though, I do want to talk about my friends at Squarespace.com, the secret behind exceptional websites. We uh, run our Twit blog on there. And I tell you, this is now it's hosting plus software. This is really the best way if you want to do a blog, a photo site. Uh, pretty much any kind of website, squarespace.com makes it easy and it makes it beautiful. And I think that's key. Best of all, you could try it free, no credit card, no commitment for 14 days. Just go to squarespace.com slash twit. Click that green button. All you'll have to do is provide a site name, a uh, password, an email address in case you forget the password. You, they have a little capture there to keep robots from doing this. And you've got a site for 14 days that you can do anything with. Where I would start is with these amazing templates. Squarespace lets you design sites like a designer without being a designer. You start with 60-plus uh, professionally designed styles, gorgeous stuff. And then, and this is what I love, they really did something brilliant here. They use Ajax so you can literally drag and drop parts of it around. You can change column widths all without any coding, without any typing. So you can completely customize the site. Now, if you do know CSS and JavaScript, well, the sky's the limit. But you don't have to to do a great site. And what I want you to do, go to squarespace.com slash twit, click the examples button, and see how different every Squarespace site is. These are not cookie-cutter sites. These are incredible sites. The photographers that use Squarespace, I mean, these are people who care about design. Care, this is their business. They need to look good. Do amazing things. Squarespace, of course, has a complete gallery uh, setup. You've got forms, a wonderful iPhone app that not only lets you post content, but also review comments, look at stats. Oh, did I say stats? Look at the stats package on Squarespace. You'll know more about your viewers, your users than anybody. Complete integration with all the social networking sites and more. It's all a great service, great software, and I want you to try it free. Go to squarespace.com slash twit. Set up your site. If you decide you want to use Squarespace for your site, it starts at $12 a month. That's including complete hosting and all the software. Always up to date. Always secure. And you'll save 10% if you use the offer code TWIT when you check out. T-W-I-T. -T. When you check out, save 10%, not for the first month or the first year, but forever for the life of your site. Squarespace.com slash twit. The secret behind exceptional websites. Jerry Pornell is here with John C. Dvorak, Larry Magid. We're having a blast talking about the future. CES, we're all going to be there, and the past. And you've told this story before on uh, Twit, but it's well worth telling again, Jerry. Why is it that OneNote works so well for Jerry Pornell? Well, I'll make it quick. Back when it was still the Soviet Union, <laughs> we went over there to Moscow and there was a guy named Stepan Panovich who had a company called Paragraph, and he was developing handwriting recognition. And his problem was he didn't have any American handwriting to recognize. So I took my logbook, and he Xeroxed about 50 pages of my log, my old handbook, uh, hand, you know, fountain pen logbook,
and Xerox about 50 pages and taught his program how to recognize that. Now, the problem is I have the world's worst handwriting. So as far as I can see, Microsoft's handwriting program <laughs> recognizes mine. If it won't recognize anybody else, that's not my problem. We all have so. to write like Jerry from now on. Isn't that great? I actually think OneNote is a great product. Um, it is. It's yeah. wonderful. And OneNote with a good tablet is just the best darn research writing machine you'll ever get. Uh, I should that we had something like the old the original HP laptop, you know. Hey, Jerry, while this you're doing that, would you move your microphone up a little bit? It's rubbing against your sweater, and it sounds like we've oh, got a, you've got a ferret in there. Okay, there you yeah, go. That's good. That. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. No, that's all right. Yeah, that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the swing wing. Uh... Yeah, I have... Um... I, but, you know, you had to use a stylus with it, which is one. Do you think, well, let me ask a question. Should Apple, should Apple add handwriting to the iPad or to some other future device? It doesn't work. That's why they didn't do it in the first place. Wouldn't Somebody interest me. It because I, my, the only thing worse than typing on a glass keyboard for me is, is handwriting. I mean, yeah. I, I handwrite at a fraction of the speed I type. And I may have even worse handwriting than Jerry. So personally, it wouldn't work for me. I wouldn't want it. But I suppose there are people who would like to have their handwriting captured. I think good speech recognition would be an excellent product. And, and if they could keep working on that, that would be helpful. You know, I had an interesting conversation. Dragon Natural with the, uh, with the iPhone. Yeah, it works very well. And Google's uh, speech recognition actually works Excellent. quite well on Android. Excellent. Uh, I had a very good conversation with a guy named Michael Cohen, who is uh, one of the big scientists at Google for speech recognition. And, and you know, I've seen uh, some debate over speech recognition. It, of course, it turns out to be much harder. We always, and I asked him, I said, when's it going to work? He says, well, about 20 years ago, everybody said five years from now. About 10 years ago, everybody said about five years from now. If you ask me today, I'll say it's about five years from now. And he said, the real problem is that for, for an engineer, five years from now means, you know, sometime in the future. Uh, it turns out to be a much harder problem. Uh, handwriting recognition is tough. Voice recognition is very, very difficult. Um, and I asked him, I said, well, uh, is it getting better? He said, yes, Be more memory space, better processors. It's not so much algorithms. There's a very famous uh, quote from one of the researchers in uh, uh, speech recognition who said, uh, the more linguists I fire from my team, the better my speech recognition gets. The reason being, if you're trying to solve it by understanding it, it doesn't work. If you do it with brute force, it does seem to work. And, and on the Android phone, Lou, I'm with you on that. I, I find it, it works reasonably well. Again, it's never going to be 100%, or at least not in the next few years. But in terms of dialing numbers, looking up restaurants, things like that, as long as it's not too noisy, it tends to work pretty well. Yeah, I agree. I use it. I use it actually to dictate texts all the time, and it's great. And to uh, yeah, the Android to, phone you know, works very well. What you do is you talk into the phone. It makes a quick call to India. Somebody <laughs> uh, listens to you, and then they write it out as though something actually happened on a computer. There, there are some services. I think Dial to Do does that. Uh, Jot used to do that. I don't know Jot. if Jot still does. Uh, and you're right; it would get much better results, <sighs> but it's too slow. The Android phone, and as does Dragon Dictate on the Apple, does phone home. It sends it to the server that does the work and then sends back the text. That's not done on the phone at all on either, in either case. All Which right. explains the brute force. That's how you get brute, brute force on right. a little device like that. You get a lot of horsepower. You know, how, did, how did the old Dragon team do it? There's a, oh, it's a great story, and, and I, uh, I don't remember it well enough to repeat it, but I'll find the blog post that talks about it. But, but the two guys... A wonderful PR girl, that uh, Renee was her name? Marie Q. Or Blodgett. Or Blodgett, yes. Blodgett. Blodgett. She's still around. Yeah. I just saw her the other day. She'll be at CES. She, she's, she was one of my favorites. Of, but they, every iteration of the Dragon program worked better than the last one. Yep. And I never have understood why that company didn't just make all the money in the world. Uh, oh, you have to look into this, the history of, the co of a company called oh, Learnout yeah. and, and Houseby. L and H. Right. And Nuance. There, was a, there were some legal issues around that uh, company. Did they recall, think, didn't somebody go to jail? I think what happened, yes. But I think what there was a whole, oh, that was a, it was a scam. But I think what happened is uh, a company, I think they were called Scansoft at the time, bought all three, right? 
bought, uh, the remnants of LNH bought Dragon, uh, bought Nuance. They renamed themselves Nuance. They killed the market by killing competition. And they did, they, I don't think they've made a lot of progress on any of those products since. Because oh. there's nobody else doing it. And, they, and IBM was doing it. Remember, they stopped doing it. Right. Yeah, but for a while there, every iteration of Dragon worked better. Yes. And it got right it got up to about 95%. Yeah, about 95%. About 95%. Now, in my case, it was no great tragedy because it turns out, like Larry, I can type faster than I can write. And, in fact, I can type faster than I can dictate. It's just that after this many years of doing this sort of thing, uh, I, I'm used to writing on a keyboard and seeing it appear on a screen and and I can turn out text that fast and mm -hmm. faster than I can dictate it. But well, for a lot of people, dictation is the best way they, they have of getting text into. And I would prefer to dictate if I have to get something out of a book into the computer and I don't have a one scanner around, I would rather dictate it than have to type it. But Well, I have a confession that probably only the three of you would even understand. <laughs> one of my first word processing programs was WordStar. And I don't know if you remember the WordStar diamond. I'm looking at my yep. keyboard. Control E was yep. up and Control yep. X was, was down. Well, I have Microsoft okay, Word yes, program to emulate that. I still use, you use the WordStar diamond. <laughs> and I also still, the caps lock key is now my control key. It's been that way forever. And I can type about 40% faster that way than with a regular keyboard and much faster, like Jerry, uh, with that keyboard than with my voice or certainly any any other interface that I've seen since. So thank you, Seymour Rubenstein, for <laughs> developing the WordStar Diamond. I'm willing still to bet it. that all three of you guys still use dot commands. Jerry, didn't you have Brief or something like that heavily customized to uh, fit your... Was it Brief uh, that you used? It was... Uh, um, uh, well, I had to... Yeah, in S100 days, we used a thing called Write, which was right. written by Tony Peach, and it was basically written for us. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, he Because Tony was so paranoid about somebody stealing copies of his thing that he never got was able to market it properly, which is... It demonstrates that if you're scared of being stolen from, the simple way to do it is not have anything to steal. That's a... But, boy, is that a good... That's the counter-argument to... Publish, you know, get get the pirated ebook because it'll sell more books. Yeah, that's the counter but, argument. Let me say um, something here before we go on. Please, John. First of all, I don't use dot commands, <laughs> and if you're going to credit anybody with that diamond, you should probably credit Rob Barnaby, who's the guy who yeah. actually wor wrote WordStar. Seymour was yeah, just but the, Seymour the, uh, was the front guy. He was the yeah. multi-level marketing guy. Who made right, he was, he was yeah. the front man. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Seymour, you can credit him with one thing. That go ahead, John. They Sorry, had an engineer at WordStar, Charlie. Yeah, Charlie remember. lives up the street from me. You're kidding. Char and Charlie used to push WordStar, and he was the most credible guy they had on their team. And if you talked to him right, if you wanted something out of WordStar, the next time you saw him, it would be in it. Yeah, well, that's true. Uh, electric Pencil, somebody mentions, was the first word sure. processor I used. What was the one and, that Captain uh, Crunch wrote in fourth? Oh, it's Easy Writer. Easy I wrote the writer. manual for that. That was easy for the writer. IBM. You in wrote one. the manual for Easy Writer? Oh, my God. I do have a bunch of old timers room. on. No, he's so oh, he's, he's going to go get the he's, manual. He's for Clemp. He went off to get the manual in the full <laughs> flush of enthusiasm. <laughs> a little too enthusiastic for me, I might add. Look what I've okay. got. Oh, so yeah. Here's the, here's the IBM out. version. Look at that. The Easy Writer manual. And yep. actually, the only time I think I've ever had a byline. Oops, I don't know. That's another one. Yeah, but this is this is the. Uh, wow, I can't believe you that, have that, Larry. What do you What do you got to? Well, he shows because it I wrote, to everyone I wrote this. who shows this up at his house. This is my first job in 1981. My first job in the industry wow. was to write the Easy Writer manual for the IBM PC. Wow. And I worked with Draper. Um, here we go. Can you see this? Did you have to spend much time with yeah. Draper? He was too much time, with Draper. But did he, he ever ask you? Uh, did he ever Sorry. ask you to wrestle? Yes, he was crazy. You know, I was I was a very young man at the time, and well, Draper did ask me to wrestle. Me too. Yes. And with Draper was my. I got a million jokes. I'm not going to use any of You don't have to make a joke. It's years. exactly what you think it is, John. <laughs> <laughs> there is no joke. That's just the way it was. Uh, I yep. did. You, you. I take it you didn't go in the back room. Whoa! No. There was, there was a room where the programmers worked, and, and you didn't want to go there. Don't want to go there. And by the way, no. never light a cigarette anywhere near John Draper 
Or he okay. will wrestle you. He's dead now. Isn't he? Did Draper? No, no, no. I don't think he's dead. Is he? No, he's he's uh, he's lost. He's not. Not a lot. He's alive. But oh, good. He's, he's, he's had, look, he's had his challenges. Let's put it that way. John has had a lot of challenges mentally, and uh, I don't know where what's going on with him now. I know he's arrested at one point for uh, producing counterfeit bar tickets, and I'm not sure what his. Oh, that was state. years and years ago. Yep, yeah, years that ago, was yeah. a long time ago. He got his back broken in prison, and he's That's never right. been kind of the same since. Yeah. But he was my roommate at at a hackers convention once, and I had no complaints. He was an interesting guy to talk to. Oh, I think yep. he was quite interesting. He's brilliant. Yep. And Waz, yeah, uh, I think even to this day, has been kind of his patron. It keeps him, I think, uh, stays in touch. I'll ask Waz oh, next I, time. I that's him. good. That 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 would be. Actually, Waz was that another. That's that conference I was at. Yeah. 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 That, that would be good. And that's just like Waz. Oh, I'm glad Waz is a it. sweetie. You, you know Waz mm -hmm. is probably doing that for a lot of old timers in yeah, the industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's move along. I'll take a little break. We'll come back. I'd like, you know, gosh, we have such an esteemed panel here with Jerry Pornell and John C. Dvorak and Larry Maggot. I would love for you guys, I know, I, I hate doing this, and you probably do too, but maybe make some predictions. Maybe what we ought to do is get together at the end of CES and give an award. <laughs> there we go. Now you're talking. You got it. All right. Uh, when, the, uh, when, uh, when do the, you leave? The, when the, do you leave? The Laporte Award for the best of show. Oh, and you, and it'll be once. a fez. And I'm going to bring one. John, I'm gonna, no, I'll let you figure out what it is, and John and I will present it jointly. A MacBook Air. And then John will never let it go. Hey, I know what I know. I know. <laughs> it'll be fun. No, well, this will be yeah. fun. I think we should I'm do this. I'm off the MacBook Air thing. Did you get one? No. Do you want one? What, do you have an extra one laying around? I'm going to bring one down for you, John. I feel really bad. I'm going to bring one down. If, if you come to do CES... Do I have to give you back the Obama mask? No, you can keep that and the Fez. And mm -hmm. uh, and when when do you leave, uh, Jerry? How long are you going to be there? Are you going to be there through Sunday? I'm going out Monday and leaving Saturday. Uh, you're leaving... I'm leaving Saturday. Saturday. I'm leaving Saturday, and, yes. and Larry, are you leaving Saturday? Yeah, I'm leaving Saturday. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be moderating an event Saturday morning and then taking off after that. Oh, you're leaving Saturday morning. No, no, no. I take off in the afternoon. We can do something around noon. -ish. I'm doing the radio show, 11 to 2. Uh, that's got the biggest audience, a million people. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you three come come over to the South Hall at noon. Eileen, make a note of this. And we will do the first annual, because <laughs> I like being big, the first annual, I don't know what we're going to call it. Well, let's look at the initials we've got here. We've got a P, we've got a D. We've got an L and an we've got an M. Well, the that's first no good. ever Pudlam Awards. <laughs> <laughs> that stinks. I know. There's we'll no work vowels. On we got a couple of days is, to well, figure it out. Well, what is our criteria going to be? Because everybody's got awards out there. We have to come up with agreement. Something. We just agree. It's like edit, all the editorial staffs. You get together and you say, "What do you think?" Yeah. And we all agree on something and give them an award. Yeah. The the well, bite that's the criteria for for the awards at Comdex was um, um, innovation. Um, uh, impact on the industry and way cool. And then they just threw it all okay. out and, and said, what and do we, we think? We do those three factors like and that. sort of talked it out until we came up with something that we agreed was innovative, would have a real impact on the industry, and was way cool. And that was the basic basis of the of the Byte Awards. And I guess those awards were probably the most famous of the Comdex Awards oh, for yes, a long absolutely. time. You I know, know what we're I'm, gonna call it. At our I names. got a name. We're gonna and, and everybody's got a consonant. There's all consonants, know, there's but nothing we do we have the JJLL awards. JJLL. How about if we call them the OFAs? What do you Ofas? think? The Of OFAs. The Old Fart Award. <laughs> yeah, that'll work. It's a possibility. You've won an OFA. And we don't tell anybody what it means. I, I don't normally, think you really normally, want to make it something that anybody would be worried about receiving because <laughs> he couldn't tell in polite society what, what the hell it What did I get? Meant. I got an OFA. And he, I, uh, I, I, we I don't know, have to explain I, it. <laughs> we'll find uh, something. 12 noon Saturday, the OFA, to be named later, awards will be awarded Live on live.twit.tv and to the world on the Premier Radio Networks. And uh, and I know, Jerry, you listen to the show. Thank you. And, yes. Uh, so, uh, so we'll do that. That'll be great. If you can make it to the South South Hall, we'll, we'll send you an email and we'll do that. And we will pick our best award. How about the OPA Awards? The Gray Hair Opa. Awards? Uh, the Geezers Award? <laughs> 
chat room is being mean right now. That's all the I can say. The past grandmasters. Of <laughs> yes. So I, you know, that maybe something with gold in the word, you know? The masters. Yeah, the masters. The masters. Award. What's the master wrong with we'll that? We'll give them a red jacket. Well, let's take a break. We're going to come back. I would like to hear what you think 2011 is going to bring us. Uh, we've got lots of... <laughs> there goes John. It's, John, put. you can do this too, guys, if you wish. Larry has taken off completely. John likes to put up like a piece of paper or something. What does it say this time, John? What is, it doesn't what is say it? anything. All right. And, uh, you know, I think if you would just move the camera and focus on our president, who seems unusually gleeful, <laughs> we can just leave it at that. How about the the cow awards, the cranky oh, old we... writer, writers awards? Cranky yeah. writers cranky awards. Cranky old writers. Uh, saving. Oh goodness, Bryn has just uh, sent us an email. Uh, apparently, John Draper has had surgery recently, has some medical issues, and uh, mm. savingcaptaincrunch.com dot com is the uh, website. And Jerry, right. you were holding up your uh, your iPad. What was that? The... That's my kingdom, of course. <laughs> we rule. How about we call it the We Rule Awards? Yeah, right. It's not bad. We do rule. So there, uh, crunch time. Actually, well, look at this picture of John. Wow. Wow. He uh, he invented the uh, blue box. He, they called him Captain Crunch because he discovered yeah. that a 2600 hertz tone could be used to reprogram the phone system and created blue boxes. And that's actually how, how uh, Wozniak and Steve Jobs got to know him because they built and sold blue boxes before Apple Computer. And it was rather ironic that AT&T put him in jail and IBM hired him indirectly to write the software, the first word processor for the IBM PC. I mean, he went from the enemy of one corporation to the servant of another. And then, unfortunately, we haven't heard a lot of stuff about him in, in recent years. Yeah, he went in for a fairly serious back surgery. This site raised money. He went in December 21st. I, I don't see an update. Uh, uh they did raise the ten thousand dollars they needed, which Good. is great. Uh, and um, I don't see, I don't see an update on uh, on his uh, status after the surgery. But it looks like there are quite a few uh, uh, vertebrae. I guess that's from the injury in in uh, in prison that you talked prison, about. Prison, yeah. yeah. He, he he always had a bad back all the time. I knew him yeah. anyway. I remember that. Uh, it says uh, an anterior cervical discectomy, cervical five, six, seven, thoracic one. And arthrodesis, something. Well, that's, that sounds like pretty serious stuff. So uh, I apologize for... Uh, he's got to be about my up. age, isn't he? I don't know if he's quite that old, Jerry. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody's <laughs> come out quite as right. I, am, I, guess, but... <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know. Anyway, we, we wish you the best, John. Um, moving along, let me uh, talk a little bit about... Uh, our friends at Citrix, a name I know you know well. All these folks know Ed Yakabuchi, the guy who started Citrix many moons ago. He was actually an IBM programmer who was loaned to Microsoft and basically wrote the NT kernel. Uh, this kind of the old, uh, I, I'll ask Jerry about that because I bet you he knows some of that story. The old story was that Microsoft wrote OS2 for IBM in effect, by lending programmers to IBM. And IBM lent programmers to Microsoft, and they wrote NT. And who got the better of that deal? Uh, the well, good news was for Ed Iacobucci is he knew yeah. NT's internals better than anybody and was able to write the best remote access code, the code that he then licensed back to uh, Microsoft. Uh, Citrix is still a very, he doesn't own it anymore, but it's still a very well-known name in uh, remote access. If you do, enter, do enterprise remote access of any kind, Citrix is what you'll be using. They also have consumer products based on the same reliable, secure, fast remote access backbone, including one I use all the time called GoToAssist Express. Now, if you're in IT, if you're in a support situation, you've got software you need to support, GoToAssist Express is incredible. It's exactly what you're looking for. First of all, it works on Mac or PC. You install it on your system, when you've got a support ticket, when you've got somebody you need to help, could be family, friends, could be colleagues, could be your job, you can send them a link or you can send them to the site. 30 seconds later, they've got the software and it's, and it's running and you're in fixing their system. From then on, you have the ability to do unattended support. You can also, and I love this, do eight sessions at once. That means you can start an install on one, a scan on another, a fix on a third, and keep going. That makes you much more productive, much more productive. Um, you can handle more support quest requests more quickly, increase your revenue. Of course, you eliminate the travel, which really is nice, and you spend a lot less time on the phone 
which I know you're going to love. I want you to try it free for 30 days. If you're in the support profession, or maybe you just have a lot of family and friends you help out, go to assist.com slash twit. It's the place to go. G-O-T-O, assist.com slash twit. 128-bit SSL encryption, 24-7 support for you. You couldn't, you couldn't find a better product for getting this job done. And I know I've tried them all. Go to assist.com slash Leo. We thank them for their support of This Week in Tech. You remember Ed Yakabuchi, right, uh, Jerry? Of course you do. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah. guy. I think he didn't he do, isn't he doing a, like a timeshare uh, for jets or something like that? NetJet or something like that? I don't think he does that anymore. Is he out of that too? I don't know. I don't think so. I, I, used mean, to, I used to party with him at Comdex. He was a guy. Gina Smith introduced me to him, and he knew how to party. By the way, I should ask you about this, Jerry. Gina yep. is going back to, to CES. She's going to cover it for a new version of Byte. Have you heard about that? I Only the rumors, that same rumors you've heard. They have not talked to me about doing anything for them. I, I don't know what they're doing. It's, it's, it's true. I, I talked, I corresponded with Gina, and they are reviving Byte.com. Reviving it, I should say, and reviving it. Uh, I believe it's going to be launching somewhere around March or April, and wow. Gina will be the editor-in-chief. And who, really, good for her. Yeah. Yeah, so Jerry, I'm sure they they'd love to have you back. I'll put a good word for you. They should talk to me, I guess. But There's a uh, name, uh, Chaos, uh, Chaos Manor, or something like yeah. that. that uh, yeah, there it is. Mm, if you go to Byte.com. Um, and who else is involved with this? It's a UBM uh, production. I've heard some other names involved with this. But good for Gina. In fact, we should get her on the show. I, she, uh, You know, Gina used to do a radio show years and years ago, Leo. I used to be on that show regularly. Yeah, what was the name of that show? I can't even remember. It's called Dvorak on Computers. John left. Oh. And then we had to take the name Dvorak right. off, so we called it On Computers. I had been reading uh, Gina Smith in print, and on a wild hair, I called her. She never called me back. She said she was too nervous. Her, her husband, Henry, made her call me back. We put her on. She was great. She was a star. She immediately, as often happens with the people I work with, surpassed me and is now... Uh, went to ABC, was their tech yep. correspondent for a long time. Uh, Larry Ellison hired her uh, for uh, Think Nick. Remember that? His uh, his ill-fated cloud computing or, uh, network computer initiative. She was the editor-in-chief at E3, or uh, e E2, Electronic Entertainment Magazine, founded the E3 conference. She was the co-author of my first book, which we both wanted to call How Do I Get the Dog Hair Out of the Disk Drive? but got bowdlerized to some lame 101 computer answers you need to know. <laughs> yes. Terrible name. Especially since Kim Commando came out with a book exactly the same time, 1,001 computer answers you need to know. Mm -hmm. So which you going to buy? 100, 1,000. She also uh, was, uh, I, you want to say ghosted, but it, but but I think really co-wrote Waz's bio, I Was. Yeah. That's the last thing That's she right. did. So I should, I keep trying to get her on Twitter. And, and I forgot, Leo, that you, of your involvement with that show. That's oh, yeah. absolutely right. On and computers. John's. On computers. John well, started it. Well, if you get a hold of her, tell her how to get a hold of me. I will. Yeah. You, want, you, you know what? She's going to be at CES. <laughs> oh, God. She should join. Wait a minute. Now, does, does adding an S, John, help our name for these awards? Because it could be the Pornell Dvorak Magid Smith Laporte Awards. It, at least it puts a little gender balance in it, <laughs> yeah, if nothing thank else. Goodness. Yeah, yeah, that'll that'll work. Great. I'll, I will I will contact Gina. She should be part of this. Especially mm -hmm. since, you know, Byte Magazine. And Jerry, come on. They got to call you. You can't have a Byte yep. Magazine without Chaos Manor. Well, that was kind of my theory on the subject, but they haven't talked to me. It's all I can tell you. I will. I, I presume they know how to get hold of me, assuming they have the old bite records. I haven't changed my phone number since 1968. So. Really? Is that true? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty. Does it have two letters in front of it? Like is it a state <laughs> or a triangle? Pennsylvania yes, six five thousand. Then when I first got this number, it no had kidding. two letters in front Can of it. Can you say yet. what yeah, the exchange I was? I know where you live, Jerry. You you live not far from where I grew up, and we had a state number. ST something yeah. or other. Yeah, I, I think it was. A, no, that was a little east of here. Harlan yep. Ellison has a state number to this <laughs> day, actually. But uh, I, mine's you might have had a triangle? Seven, six. I can't remember what I, it is. I think we need but, to go retro, and everybody needs to look at the first two. You know, there's about most, of the, I would say 90% of the people listening have no idea what any of you are talking about. Right. But I think we need to go back and figure out what the first two digits of your seven-digit phone number are and find an abbreviation. 
Like Pennsylvania six five thousand. What the hell happened there, John? Did you or is that Larry? Oh, that's Larry. He's going to show me. us. Oh, Hold ladies on. and gentlemen. Now, for the kids watching today, in the old days of telephony, you had to rent your phone from the phone company. They had a division called Western Electric. So and not, you guys recognize this, right? Yeah. Not only did you have to rent a phone, but you had to dial the phone. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you actually had to dial. The, I, I bet you there are people watching this show that when have I never was seen a, kid. a dial, sh dial phone. <laughs> John's just... This one has a lot of dust on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they call it dial tone to this day. People still say dial the phone, but I don't think my kids know what that where that the genesis of dial the phone is. They talk about dial tone. Uh, yeah. Leo, can you, you help pick out up the phone? You get a dial tone. Sure. Where's the uh, where's the send button on this? I can't quite figure out how this operates. How do I turn it off? I don't know. What do you do? With how it? Could, wait a minute. I got to ask you, Larry. Why do you have a, a Western Electric dial phone there? Well, probably for nostalgia, but at one and it is Western Electric. You're absolutely right. Uh, at one point, I used to take these apart and I would put uh, audio jacks in them, well, that's so a good I could idea. do radio interviews before I had all this fancy oh, yeah. equipment. Sure, yes, and sure. Yeah, Waz, yeah. Uh, Waz carries one around, really an old one, a black hard rubber one, you know. And there's a cell phone built Make into a it. Bakelite. Bakelite. That's right. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. And there's a cell phone. You pick. I think Think Geek sells them. You pick it up and you dial it, and it somehow connects to the cell phone and makes the call. Mm -hmm. He will He will sit at the table. I'm, I'm going on a cruise with him in about uh, a month. And he'll sit at the table with his big black phone, and it'll ring. <laughs> Somebody gave me a big old black handset, which is a Bluetooth connector to my, yeah. my Apple phone, but I don't use it much. Yeah, there you go. So any predict predictions, uh, uh, guys, uh, either for CES or for the year ahead, are we going to see 800 iPad clones? Will somebody do one that actually can succeed? Um, are we? Yeah, I, I, br I brought a prop. It's, it's, a, it's a pill box. It's all about tablets. <laughs> and, uh, and we're going to see a gazillion, a gazillion tablets. Oh, yes. Most of them will be fairly crappy, I suspect, and, and a lot of them will be Android. Uh, beyond that, you know, we'll, we'll see a lot more of the thing. I just, I just wrote an article that's... Uh, on the front page of the Huffington Post tech section, which is uh, my wish that things slow down a little bit, that we don't just see so many products come out that once again we're just overwhelmed and inundated with a lot of crap. Doesn't but, but that I'm just sure show how it. old you are, Larry? No, I, I, I don't. Actually, the funny thing, you, you say that, you know, I have young kids, our kids in their early 20s, and they're not only a little less tech savvy than I am, but even less interested than I am on every single gadget that oh, comes out. Well, I'll grant you that. You know, when yeah, when you talk my, to my kids, the, couldn't care less. People, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're yeah. happy. My son's got a Nexus One. He's not craving the Nexus S. He's happy with it. We are in so a bubble. I, I There's no question about that. Well, as I've been saying for years, we've got to the point where Moore's Law ran way ahead of the of the concepts. With the the hardware is capable of things, and the software is not caught up with it. So we've got the equipment to do a lot of things that just don't happen. Yeah. And I think also, and we talked about this earlier about handwriting recognition and speech recognition, I think user interface is still the one territory that we have a lot of work to do. Obviously, Apple has done incredible work in that area, but we're making devices smaller and smaller, more and more powerful, but we still are limited by how we get information in and out, especially in. And I would like to see some some breakthrough yeah. in terms of user interface. Hmm. And in terms of bandwidth, aren't we really throttled, especially as we move to mobile, by the lack of bandwidth? Absolutely. In fact, the, even, even some of the 4G phones are not giving us the, the kind of bandwidth you need if you're really going to be, be moving an incredible number of bits around with video. Uh, I just think we, we have a long way to go. And, of course, as, as you know, Leo and, and the rest of you, you get out of the U.S., you get over to Korea and some other countries, and, and we're pikers compared to what, what some of the Asian countries have. A yeah. um, couple of uh, transitions, as Newsweek used to call them. There was a guy <laughs> uh, who uh, used to promote his website by publishing fake death notices for celebrities on Twitter. He's dead now. Okay, just mentioning it. I don't know. That could be karma. He just mm. passed away. Uh, I can has said triple X dot triple X dead at least till the end of this year. Um, MySpace got to be putting that on the death watch list. 
Uh, according to businessinsider.com, MySpace is planning to fire half of its staff. There's only 1,100 people still at MySpace. Rupert Murdoch has for a while now been rumored to be wondering, what the hell do I do with this thing that I bought? Yeah. Uh, Does anybody really know how MySpace foundered so badly compared to the market share it used to have, yeah. how uh, Facebook suddenly just took over the world that way? Seems like I it would be a really, a really good lesson, uh, a morality yeah. tale. Why do you think, Larry? Because it was tacky. I mean, even, you know, they hired this guy, Himanshu Nigam, as a security officer, and they really cleaned up the safety issue, the predator issue. That, that was fixed. But it, it remained tacky. The advertising they would put up. Does uh, anybody, hold on, Larry. Freedom. Does yeah. anybody but me find these coincidences uh, kind of disturbing? They cleaned up the predators. They cleaned up this, and then it started to fail. Maybe they're having the predators was uh -huh. a good thing. It's like well, there's a guy on the, the Daily uh, the Comedy Central's <laughs> Daily Show once that says, you know, if there's a lot of predators, that means there must be a lot of prey. That's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, they is it possible that that was the cool thing about MySpace? I don't know. No, I don't think so. I think the predator threat was, was and is still way over exaggerated. The predators, it was it, overblown. It, it, it was it, bull crap, right. but it was at least made. Yeah. The, the whole thing was tacky, and it was good that it was tacky. I think people, it's like but, going to the, the old uh, Times Square in the olden days when it was sleazy. I mean, you'd go, and now it's just crappy. It's just, well, they you did, know, a bunch was, of the Disney things. They did clean it up. I mean, it, it, the, yeah. the UI is much nicer, pretty Facebook, now it but is. it's much nicer. Too late, obviously. Um, yeah. Somebody's saying it's like GeoCities or Tripod. Both of those were pretty hideous, and they're both gone. But on I, the I other hand, I think space. MySpace was heavily used and was very important for independent musicians. I think it was really the first place independent musicians got to, got to get some exposure without a record label. That's right. And in fact, it's still used by a lot of, a lot yeah. of musicians, and that's where it started. But it became sort of the teenage playground for a long time, and it was very popular among teenage kids. And also, MySpace allowed for a lot of creativity. You could do almost anything on your homepage, including bouncing balls and four different kinds of music playing at the same time. And it was a cacophony. It was just a, such a messy environment. And then Facebook came along, first of all, with its elite Harvard uh, clientele to begin with, and they expanded it to colleges and then branched out to the rest of us. They came along with a much cleaner interface. But sometimes I worry with all the applications and all the changes to Facebook that, that it could be going gradually and slowly in that same direction. So, all right. I know I'm not going to get any predictions out of you. Are we asked, still in predictions? I've I asked like three any. times. I'll I, give you a prediction. Yeah. Yeah, what? You said you'll give me a prediction. Okay, a prediction. I, there's going to be more and more encroachment by the federal government and other governments based in Europe and elsewhere on the Internet. We're going to start seeing... Uh, a situation start to uh, apply where the FCC starts to move in. They tried to uh, they tried yep. to at one time move in on cable TV, but there was too much pressure against that. But now they see the internet wide open. Using a, a the shoehorn issue, of course, is net neutrality. They're going to find a way to become all of a sudden the you know the gatekeeper of the internet. And the next thing you know, they're going to be licensing for blogs and all the rest of it. It's going to be a complete disaster, and it's coming your way. So oh, yeah, except that I said, told you that on on this show about two years ago when you were a big enthusiast for net neutrality in those days. Well, I still you said am. if we didn't get net neutrality, we were going to end up at 200 baud or something. Well, I, I still am. You, I, I think we're being... You, I tell you, I told you. <laughs> no, I, and, and we don't have net neutrality. We don't have the, net neutrality. The FCC's attempt no, to pass it is, is so No, but the FCC is going to use that issue as the, that was the problem. The problem with these things is that net neutrality may be a great thing to do, but if you you create a bureaucracy to do something it won't do what you told it to it will do what it wants to do no I, and i agree with you and that's obviously a problem we're facing i mean look uh, we're, we're squeezed in two has directions been told by congress not to touch the internet it's been told by the courts not to touch the internet so what did they do they immediately came out with regulations saying that they're in charge of the internet after all jerry right? So, so they're getting it from the left and the right. I mean, there are plenty of bloggers that are complaining that the FCC sold out, that it didn't do enough, you know, that it, that it, that it basically uh, was a cop-out, that we've got uh, other people on the right who are complaining that it's uh, taking over the Internet, that it's going to be socialism. I think the fact of the matter is it did practically nothing. 
And whether or not this net neutrality turns out to have any impact at all, we'll have to see. But I doubt if it's going to accomplish anything. It asserted in either its right to do something which it was explicitly told it did not have the authority to do. Once it gets away with the right, you will be surprised what it does. That isn't my why? prediction. Why? I'm just, why? Why? why, Jerry? Why? 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 Why would they want to do that? What would be the interest of the FCC in doing that? Well, let me we, take over for a second, Jerry. You can tag the team. Ah. Okay. Jerry, hold on. Do you, do you Jerry. want me to go on a little further of some of the things that the net does that irritates the government? It can't you think of a lot of things that the net does that the government wishes didn't happen? Well, I can think of one. Well, Wiki, it's not Wiki only that. It's not only that. Let me interrupt here. It's not about having worked for the government at one point. The government agencies, especially something like the FCC, which is losing a lot of authority because broadcasting and all these other things are less and less important, wants to do something with its people. They want to expand like all other government agencies, and this is an excuse to do it for no other reason. It just turns out that most of this will be bad for everybody. Yeah, you got it. I mean, it's Pernell's iron law of bureaucracy. Bureaucracies are, uh, you know what, I, what I, my iron law, bureaucracies have two kinds of people. They're the kind of people who are dedicated to what the bureaucracy was created to do, like classroom teachers, most of them. And there are people who are dedicated to making sure the bureaucracy itself has, has, has power and stability Guys. and continuity. Did, the second the kind always get in control. Always. There never and was the a bureaucracy where the second It's not as if the FCC started. invented net neutrality. There's been pressure from a lot of corners, including a number of Internet companies that are worried about the cable companies and the phone well, companies. Throttling them. So it's not it's just not about Washington net neutrality. Press, that's the point. That are coming every, up with network neutrality. It was also part of Obama's campaign promise. Well, every pornography producer in the world wants net neutrality. Okay. Everybody would love to have the rest of us subsidize the kid down the street who spends 24 hours a day downloading porn. <laughs> or whatever. There's no, uh, it's not about net neutrality. It's about government encroachment, and that's what the real key yeah. is here. And the other reason that you leave out in your law, Jerry, is the fact that the only way that you can make more money in the government is if your agency gets bigger and you have more people to supervise. Well, yeah, but that's Parkinson's law. I didn't invent that. That's been around since C. Northcote Parkinson wrote Parkinson's laws 30 years ago. And it's all I true. The, Governments expand biggest, to, uh, without regard to their jobs, they just expand. The biggest push from Washington is going to be on privacy. Facebook is going to do something to really piss off Congress, and I don't know what they're going to do. The Federal Trade Commission is already making noises, although admittedly tepid noises, and I think we're going to see some type of privacy legislation in 2011, and I think the industry is going to be really split over whether to support it or not. Well, I love Another it. Another so, excuse to butt in. For, for three guys who weren't willing to give me any predictions, those are some pretty damn good predictions. Thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah, my, my, I, I'm, I am... We'll bring up something none of nobody has. I wouldn't write off Microsoft on things. Microsoft has been interested in tablets for a long time. And whether it's this year's tablet or next year, Microsoft is eventually going to come up with a with an iPod um, comp competitor that that will do things with all that tablet technology that, that Microsoft has got and never quite figured out how to do the interfacing for. You're going to go to you Steve Ballmer's uh, keynote and see his announcement? Because they're going to have about probably. eight tablets, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, uh, Ballmer, the problem with Microsoft is that nobody left to do vision. Gates was the heart of that company, and he had real visions, and we don't see much of that. Ballmer's a great executive officer. He just wasn't, he, he just doesn't see too far ahead. He's very good at carrying out dreams once somebody comes up with them. They thought Ray Ozzy would do it for him, but that didn't work. Couldn't do it. No. And, and they don't huh? have anybody who has the vision that Gates had. Yeah. And that, well, that, can and, and jobs. there may not be a lot of people in the world that have that kind of vision. Well, yeah, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Sure, uh, but on the other hand, they have the leftovers of, of Gates's view. I mean, Gates was a big tablet enthusiast. And my eventual prediction 
is that we're going to have the pocket computer that I had in Moat and God's Eye. It's a little too big to fit in your pocket, so we're going to have to come up with some kind of carry bag that men carry. So your iPhone <laughs> and your, your iPad and all the rest of it are all one of device. Course. Why would you want an iPhone plus an iPad? Right. You, need, you need both. You don't need a Kindle because the iPad is easier to read using Kindle's software than, than it is with the Kindle. Well, Jerry, uh, this isn't a prediction, but, you know, Gates is still chairman of Microsoft. Maybe he I could know. turn the foundation over to Melinda and he could take it back over mm. as CEO. It's been done before. If he wants to. And I know it's been done before. And I wonder if sometimes Bill doesn't uh, uh, kind of chafe at the, at the bit about not about watching what's happening with the company. Um, all it takes is a big injection of vision again. They have the money. They have the people. Maybe they don't have quite all the top people that uh, that Google's getting some away from them and other places. But Microsoft has an awful lot of very bright people. They have the determination, and they go through the iterations of things. And eventually, they will iterate up to something you like. I mean, you you look what they did in games. They Gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to table this conversation. Connect. I'm going to table this conversation and adjourn this meeting until 12 noon Pacific time on Saturday when we are going to announce the SOFA Awards, the significant right. old fart awards. Or something. <laughs> <So. laughs> I hope we'll they come up stink. with a better name, I'm sure. Well, G Gina's uh, young, so we can't call it that. So we'll, yeah, we'll find something. But we are going to find our best product at CES, and we'll announce that. Uh, on uh, on uh, Saturday, but I know all three of you will be part of our broadcast. We go Twit goes to CES Wednesday evening. We start with digital experience. Tom Merritt and Becky Worley uh, from ABC News will be covering that. We'll have Brian Brushwood with us. Sarah Lane, I'll be there. Uh, we are going to cover wall to wall CES better than it's ever been covered before. And a thanks to these three guys, I think we're going to have some superior coverage on Saturday as well. And Jerry, uh, you said you'd be in the press room. We'll come by and 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 talk to you there as well. All right. Jerry Pornell, jerrypornell.com. Go there and uh, subscribe to the Chaos Manor columns. Well worth it. And maybe someday we'll see it back again uh, in Byte Magazine. I would love to see that. That would, be, that would be a move in the right direction. Also, John C. Dvorak, channeldvorak.com. That's where you'll find him, No Agenda, and a bunch of other shows. And, of course, uh, he's got uh, <laughs> Barney Obama <laughs> there with him. <laughs> What happens when you press his hand? Does he ask for money? Oh, All right. <laughs> Thank you, John. Larry Maggot is at yeah. Larry's World. You also hear him on CBS Radio. And uh, you got a phone call, Larry? I'm, I'm talking to Jimmy Carter. He just called on his phone. <laughs> well, uh, I thank you all for joining us. Please do join us at live at CES. We're going to be Wednesday evening, Thursday evening, all day Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The next twit will be a Saturday twit. You're all invited again, 3 p.m. Pacific Time, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, live.twit.tv for all that CES coverage. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being here. We'll see you next time. Another twit this is, is in the can. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I can't top that. You can't top it. Hey, before I say goodnight, I do want to remind you that uh, we are beginning our seventh year. Wow at twit.tv and I'd like to ask uh, some help if you don't mind we do this every year uh, our podcast advertising agency PodTrack likes to do a survey of our audience it helps us sell uh, twit we know how many people listen but we don't know much about you so the more we know about your demographics the better it's about a five page online survey easy to take if you just go to twit.tv and click the link at the top of the page. You can take it. Or go to bit.ly slash listener survey. It's an easy way to do it, too. Twit.tv at the top of the page. Take our survey. Or bit.ly slash listener survey. At the end of the survey, it will ask if you'd like to join the PodTrack panel. That's a very useful research panel that we come back to you a few times a year and uh, ask you questions. Again, this helps us a lot uh, with making our advertisers happy. And when happy advertisers pay money to put the show on the air, I'm happy and you're happy because then, then we can do what we do like these uh, trips to CES. So I appreciate any help you can give us. Thank you. <laughs>